If we cast our mind back to previous lectures, when I was considering the nature of scientific knowledge and its relationship to biography, we'll always find people falling into one of two camps. On the one hand, you'll find people sympathetic to the project of science, putting forward the idea that all we need to understand the methods by which the scientists went about their business. On the whole, the ideal is that there should be no interference from the outside world. If the outside world intervenes in terms of the way that the knowledge is being shaped, then it is likely to make the theory untenable, unscientific, pseudoscientific even. Bad science is the product of external factors impacting upon the way that scientists go about their business. And then there are the others, often historians, more often sociologists or philosophers, who see the production of knowledge, all knowledge, as being infinitely more complicated than merely the accretion of facts and the shaping of theories. They will see the influence of society and of culture upon the way that the scientist looks at the world. When we look at Darwin's delay, we're dealing with a conflict between these two different points of view, between those that see science, proper science, as being merely the purview of experiment, observation, hypothesis formation, and hypothesis testing, and those who see knowledge as being integrated with the way that we do society. Until about the 1950s, nobody talked about Darwin delaying. Nobody thought anything of that gap between his 1844 essay and him starting to write Natural Selection in 1856. Neither did they think of the longer gap from his Eureka moment in 1837 to the publication of his joint paper with Wallace in 1858. That's 21 years. But a number of things happened after the Second World War. The new synthesis had once again brought Darwin to the forefront of biological thinking. He was big news again, however discredited. But furthermore, increasingly large amounts of material, correspondence, notebooks and the like, were coming out and being looked at by historians of science to try and determine how Darwin had developed his thinking. And from that point onwards, people start hypothesising about the gap. A number of theories have been put across in the course of the years. And I put these forward in no historiographical order. I just thematize them. The first one that we have to consider is the fear of radicalism and the disruption of the status quo, that his theory might have given impetus to people who were seeking to change the established political order. The second is that he knew that underlying his theory was a materialism that would result in people questioning the very nature of religious orthodoxy. But he also knew that it was the religiously orthodox that controlled the establishment, and he was concerned that they would turn upon him and persecute him and humble him. There were then personal issues surrounding his wife, his family and his friends. One view that was put forward was that his father was a tyrant and during the 1840s until the period he died he did not want to risk upsetting the tyrannical Robert. We've already seen that Robert was not really that much of a tyrant. His wife too was identified as someone that might have put a break on his theorising and indeed even his old ship's captain from the Beagle, Fitzroy, an evangelical Christian, was mooted as someone that Darwin wanted to avoid upsetting. And then it has been theorised. He was put off by the reception to the vestiges of creation. 
And we've already seen the quote where he seems to be horrified by the way that Sedgwick has attacked the anonymous work that was written by Robert Chambers. Finally, we see emerging from a combination of these that he was torn apart by an inner psychological conflict that expressed itself in some form of psychosomatic disease. So tortured was he by the implications of his theory that he became sick and this sickness prevented him for a great deal of time from avoiding writing and bringing before the publish his theory of transmutation through natural selection. These ideas of a fear-motivated gap reached their apogee in the writing of Desmond and Moore when they published their biography of Darwin in 1992. Remember how the American subtitle for the book, The Tortured Evolutionist, and throughout Desmond and Moore's book we can see a lot of psychological torture and a lot of psychological trauma and a great deal of fear of what the social repercussions would be from publishing his evolutionary theory. Writing about that period in the 1830s that I've already alluded to, when there was an upswing in Chartist and other demonstrations against the political power that seemed to be oppressing the common people. This is how they told the story. The B notebook is filled, C has begun, as they describe it. It is 1839. England is rumbling towards anxiety with countrywide unrest and riots. The gutter presses are fizzing, firebombs flying. The shouts on the streets is for revolution. Red evolutionists, visionaries who see life marching inexorably upward, powered from below, denounce the props of the old static society, priestly privilege, wage exploitation and the workhouses. A million socialists are castigating marriage, capitalism and the fat, corrupt, established church. Radical Christians join them, hymn-singing dissenters who condemn the fornicating church as a harlot in bed with the state. In that writing you can see why people enjoy reading this book so much. Its use of alliterations and other literary tropes gives it a force and a power that suck the reader in. Even science must be purged, for the gutter atheists, material atoms are all that exist, and like the social atoms, people, they're self-organising. Spirits and souls are a delusion party of the gentry's cruel deceit to subjugate working people. The science of life, biology lies ruined, prostituted, turned into a creationist citadel by the clergy. Britain now stands teetering on the brink of collapse, or so it seems to the gentry, who close ranks to protect their privileges. And then they ask, at this moment, how could an ambitious 30-year-old gentleman open a secret notebook and with a devil-may-care sweep suggest that headless hermaphrodite mollusks were the ancestors of mankind? Moreover, Cambridge trained and once destined for the cloth, a man whose whole family hate the fierce and licentious radical hooligans. But what they then go on to demonstrate is that Darwin had far from a devil-may-care attitude to this. For the next 15 years, they chart the horror, the psychological terror that he moves through. They emphasise the light committing a murder. They emphasise that his illness is the psychosomatic product of being torn apart by the challenge that he felt his theory would raise against the established order of science. To them, there is no doubt that Darwin's science was shaped very much by his time. There is no doubt that the Desmond and Moore view of the tortured evolutionist became something of an orthodoxy over the years from 1992 onwards to the extent that it's 
a viewpoint that's been propagated in documentaries like Darwin's Dangerous Idea and also Darwin's Brave New World. To be sure, Janet Brown, whose volumes of biography followed hard on the heels of Desmond and Moore's biography, downplays the extent to which Darwin's fear created the gap. And yet at the same time, there are still elements that play to this particular idea. So I don't think it's unfair to say that the fear equals gap thesis was something that had become the genuinely held view of why it was that Darwin took so long to publish his ideas. The way that history works, though, is that an orthodoxy gets established and then historians start looking at it and getting suspicious. And this is definitely what happened when John Van Wy, a man who seems to have spent most of his adult life in the company of the historical memory of Darwin, looked at the records. And who better to look at those records than John Van Wy? For he had been in charge of both putting together the Darwin online archive and the Darwin correspondence archive. This gave him plenty of time as he organised the transcription of these sources so they could be read by anyone in the world to try and think about the issue of the gap and think he did. And in thinking, he came up with a revisionist question that attacked the motives and the ideas of authors like Desmond and Moore. There is no doubt that John Van Wy has something of conservative cast of mind. He's not the kind of individual who's going to be attracted to theories that believe that scientific knowledge is determined by social factors, particularly social factors that highlight the radical nature of the knowledge content. Now what Van Wy did was he did something that I think is very clever, very historiographical, he decided to piece together a history of the delay to see when it started and then who was propagating it. And as he went through this exercise, he decided that the delay was an artefact of ideological historians who were blinded by the drive towards social constructionism. It then became imperative to demonstrate that there was no delay that in fact Darwin was behaving like a normal scientist. Now there were two particular avenues that Van Wy decided to go down. One was to explore the nature of the fear and to ask the question, was Darwin really afraid or not? And the angle that he approached this from was to look and see in the correspondence and Darwin's notes who he had told that he was working upon transmutation during the crucial gap years. So he, he was looking at the idea that had been propagated by many of the historians, including Desmond and Moore, that Darwin had kept his transmutationist leanings as a secret. Of course, Desmond and Moore and a number of other historians have laid a great deal of weight on the seeming anxiety, the confessing a murder correspondence to Hooker. This was the original letter that Darwin wrote in 1845. I'm almost convinced that species are not. It is like confessing a murder, immutable. Heaven forfend me from Lamarck's nonsense of a tendency to progression, adaptations from the slow willing of animals, etc. But the conclusions I'm led to are not widely different from his, though the means of change are wholly so. I think I've found out his presumption, the simple way by which species become exquisitely adapted to various ends. Most historians, when they've looked at this, have taken Darwin literally and have imagined him saying, it is like confessing a murder. Whereas Van Wy said, why couldn't it have been? a jokey throwaway line. And to back this up, the idea that it's sort of like confessing a murder, he provided a long list of names of people that Darwin had told that he was working on transmutation. And each name in this long list 
is intended as a bell tolling against the ideas of Desmond and Moore. Just look at the list unfold. Emma Darwin, Robert Darwin, Erasmus Darwin, his children, Hensley and Elizabeth Wedgwood, William Lonsdale, Hugh Strickland, Edward Forbes, Hugh Faulkner, Ernst Stiefenbach, Fletcher, Edward Cressy, J.S. Henslow, Leonard Horner, Leonard Jennings, Richard Owen, G.R. Waterhouse, J.D. Fox, William Darwin Fox, Charles Lyell, C.J.F. Bunbury, Asa Gray, T.H. Huxley, T.V. Wollaston, H.C. Watson, J.D. Dana, E.L. Layard, C.A. Murray, E. Norman. There's a, a sort of poetry to this list when you read it out. On the face of it, it looks like an extraordinarily long list of confidants, on top of which some of these names were the greatest names in science of the period. Take, for example, Richard Owen, who was the principal comparative anatomist of his day and would go on to become a forceful critic of Darwin's ideas. So on the face of it, if we take the rhetorical device of the list, Darwin was not experiencing fear. And all of those other things that stem from the fear thesis, like his psychosomatic illness, cannot be the case. A lot rides on the list in Van Wy's thesis. The other part of his argument, which I'll just sketch over at the moment, is that Darwin always knew how long that it was going to take him to work through the different parts of his research. In other words, he was aware that barnacles would take a certain amount of time. Having said that, Van Wy also factors in that he was delayed further because of his sickness and because of his grief. And both of those, of course, were very real. But the end result is Darwin was not being pressured by social forces, by the state of society at his time, and that the gap itself was nothing but an empty myth produced by ideological historians. Van Wy cut to the heart of the speculative nature of the interpretation that historians like Desmond and Moore had placed upon the way that Darwin came up with his theory. But then, in many ways, speculation is the historian's game. There's so much that we can never prove. There are always gaps that we have to fill with interpretation. Van Wy's own interpretation has the power of common sense. Certainly, when I first read the paper, I was struck by how plausible, how feasible it appeared. And, of course, as a historian, you're always looking out for that better interpretation, that revision, that moving on from a past position. So, for many people, and I'm sure it'll be the case for most of you, the Van Wy case appears cut and dried. What I will say at this point is any theory is only as good as the evidence that underlies it. And it pays when we're looking at the evidence that Van Wy brings to bear upon this issue to reanalyze the evidence forensically, closely, tracking down each piece and seeing whether it will bear the weight of Van Wy's interpretation.